Hello everyone, thank you for attending my talk. So I'm Mathieu Daroussin, I'm working at Gandhi um, and I will explain you what uh, drivers to use FreeBSD for the filers, uh, what we call the high density filers. Uh, we consider them high density by given the number of data sets we have on those filers and uh, apparently it's pretty unusual to have as many data sets. I'm also a FreeBSD developer uh, working on FreeBSD for a while now and breaking things uh, most of the time. So first I explain what Gandhi is. Uh, Gandhi is a registrar. It's a registrar since 1999. Uh, it's also a certificate provider, so you can buy uh, self certificates uh, at Gandhi. It's also since 2007 uh, providing two services. So what we call servers, which are uh, others might call cloud. Uh, so there are VMs available for users and uh, simple hosting, which is uh, uh, mostly PaaS, uh, PHP, uh, MySQL, and other things like this. So as I said, since 2007, uh, we are uh, providing uh, we are providing uh, VMs to users. Uh, since day one, they are backed by um, Nextenda servers, so we're using ZFS. And uh, we are now looking at refreshing those filers. So why are we um, making a study on what could replace the Nexenta is uh, first with Nexenta it is very very complicated to uh, provide a non-attended setup and we want to uh, install our filers automatically without having to uh, get um, a sysadmin around it making all the setup. Uh, we got difficulties with uh, the with the fact that on Solaris, if you want a uh, new disk to be multipass, then the driver needs to know uh, that this new manufacturer, which was not already uh, validated by uh, the Solaris developer, uh, has to be, uh, well, the manufacturer has to be in the kernel in the list uh, to uh, actually be able to be used as multipass. Meaning that on Zambing, we changed the, the manufacturer, the, the list of disks that we will pushed into our uh, filers and we had all the time to uh, modify a kernel driver and reboot the filer, which is something we don't like to do much. Uh, we have our own middleware to run everything, to run the VMs and then to create also a uh, data set on the filers. Our middleware is based on Python and Python sucks pretty much a lot on uh, Nexenta. And, uh, it was uh, stuck to an old version, I think it's 2.5, and uh, very buggy on a lot of parts, so we have to do, you know, to do a lot of work around, rewrite some of the classes provided by Python so that they work, they kind of work properly on uh, Nexenta. And the more our filers were used, the more they became high density, the, the slower they were to boot, so that pull import would take a while, uh, exporting iSCSI devices would take a, a while. And uh, in the end, we ended up with some filers rebooting in something like uh, 40, 45 minutes, which is a lot. So we don't want to uh, have those kind of things. So of course, we have failovers, but we prefer having fast boot. So we started making a study uh, on the different um, solution we can have to replace those filers. So we had some requirements. We were very happy with ZFS, so we wanted to keep on with ZFS. It was providing exactly what we wanted. It was simple enough for us to integrate with our, with our middleware. Uh, we were happy with the performance, uh, so it was great. We wanted the server to be able to handle more than thousands of different NFS clients at the same time uh, without having uh, much issues uh, and around a thousand of ISQC uh, exporting uh, properly and having all these clients doing fancy stuff on the ISQC without the server dying. Uh, we use a lot of NFS and only NFS v4, so we needed something which has uh, NFS v4, uh, proper support for NFS v4 with delegation. Um, we wanted powerful developer tools that when you run server on when you're on server, you often have issues, you often have strange things that are not supposed to. When you push them to the limits, then you find new bugs. So being able to trace things using stuff like dtrace, mdb was very important for us. We had that through uh, Nexenta. 
So we wanted that on the new uh, refreshment for the spiders. Um, of course, we wanted to access all those jbots through uh, those jbots through uh, multipass, and uh, of course, we wanted to avoid having too much internal to be able to get new disk or new manufacturers on those uh, jbot via multipass. We want open source companies uh, for a strong supporter of uh, open source technologies uh, since day one. It was actually created by a previous developer back in the time, uh, and we have continued always using open source technologies, pushing back the open source technologies and supporting them. So we want to, as much as we can, continue on open source. And we want a community that is easy to reach so that we can upstream the patch as soon as we have them. We don't want to end, to, to end up with a huge amount of patches that were uh, sitting somewhere uh, and we cannot upstream anymore. So we want to be able to quickly upstream, quickly get feedbacks, and we can be able to commit. And we wanted the ability to run some containers because uh, those filers are also providing other services related to storage, but we wanted to isolate them, uh, so having kind of containers would be a good idea. So we got candidates. Uh, of course, if you speak about ZFS, one of the first candidates are all the Lemos family. Uh, so we have been looking at what was happening there. Uh, we could use uh, Open Indiana, OmniOS, uh, maybe SmartOS, or uh, even simpler, a newer version of Nexenta, seeing what they've done since and where, where they are gone. Uh, the other candidates available were also FreeBSD and Linux with the uh, ZFS on Linux uh, module. So the first we study was uh, Linux. We really did it quite quickly because uh, due to um, Differences between the license, the DFS support on Linux can be upstream, <laughs> and that means that each time uh, you need to update your kernel or Linux kernel, you need to make sure that there is all, uh, no no regression at all against this, this uh, the interfaces used uh, by the DFS on Linux module, or that there is no uh, incompatibilities, and it was going to be a, a huge pain. So we decided quickly that Linux was not the solution. So we ended up looking at the Lemos family. Uh, so the first one obviously would have been Nexenta. We were already in Nexenta, making an upgrade would have been pretty simple. So the reason why we rejected that is uh, I do not consider that really open source anymore. Uh, we get a community version for only 18 terabytes uh, support, which is uh, half of what we need uh, per filer. Uh, at least, and uh, our streaming to uh, Nexenta was not really easy. Well, we could have streamed to uh, Lemos, but we have got no guarantee on when it will happen and uh, be available on Nexenta. So because of that, we decided that Nexenta would not be a good solution for us. So we went to Open Indiana and we re rejected also that solution because the community was pretty small. We wanted something uh, which is for a lot supported. And the community was too small for us. We tried to reach some people. Uh, we didn't manage to really get involved in things. So uh, we did that. The other thing is we customize our system, and so we want to rebuild it. We might provide patches. And the build system of Vanilla uh, is pretty fragile. It depends on some blobs that have not been open sourced by uh, Oracle uh, or by Sun at the time. And uh, it still has, well, at the time we made the survey, it still had the old uh, Python 2.6, which was still as buggy as uh, the one 2.5 we got on the next center. So we decided not to do that one. We went to SmallRest. SmallRest seems to be the most active, uh, the most active Elemos, uh, Elemos based uh, operating system available right now. Even if they claim themselves that they are not uh, made for filers, we would say maybe because they have the container we need, they have the LFS, they have uh, all the features we need, so probably it would be a good idea to, uh, to go to SmartOS. We tested a lot to try to rebuild it, we managed to rebuild, make a lot of things with it. The thing is, uh, we need to uh, modify the global zone. So global zone, for those familiar, not familiar with uh, SmartOS, is basically like uh, a down zero. It's a very thin uh, zone, which is the first one SmartOS boot on, and then create other zones. 
So we needed to modify the global one because we need to access things which are not available uh, via other zones. So we cannot create our own zone with our own stuff because we could not be able to export I2C, for example. We could not be able to modify uh, the NFS configuration and expose new NFS. So that's the reason why we rejected that. And so, other than rejecting the virus family of the Illumos, we still tried a lot to see what we still had on the Illumos. The problem with Illumos is uh, the ISCSI, the way they export it, is really not made for our usage, as we might export at once, 1000 ISCSI at the same time, and uh, doing that on Illumos was basically having the client and saying, please, Export the first one, the second one, the third one, and doing that for the thousand of them, and you ended up with something like that took 20 minutes to expose all the all the ice cases. So that's really not what we wanted. Well, I know that you can provide uh, more uh, through the configuration file at the boot at the start time of the ice case, but you cannot provide until uh, 1,000. So it's, well, it's really not good for us. Do you still have to kernel the? the um, you still have to patch the kernel each time you want to add a new disk manufacturer which was not validated. So it was still a pain to, um, to go to, uh, to Elemus based family for that. So in the end, we have studied FreeBSD. So uh, on FreeBSD, uh, we went to it for various reasons. There are good points. So it has strong reputation on storage area. There is a lot of people making storage appliances, making uh, on, uh, making uh, using ZFS, uh, there is a lot of things around the storage area, so we were pretty confident that it would be a good solution. Uh, on since FreeBSD 10, there was a lot of improvement in the ISQC target, which was one of the weakness of FreeBSD before, and we were very surprised by the quality of CTLD and how easy it was for us to use it. And for example, to uh, expose uh, 1000 ice cases, it takes something like one second. So it was a huge improvement for us. Um, it has very good NFSC4 support. Unfortunately, there is no MDB, but we figured out that most of the things we were doing through MDB on the next center, we could do it, do it automatically via syscontrol. And because most of the time we use this MDB to modify uh, some variables in the kernel on the fly. And FreeBSD has a very uh, complete syscontrol entry, yes? On the NFSV4 support, are you going to talk about, do you, are you using delegations? Yes. Yeah. It worked? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> 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 I'm saying. <laughs> it works very well, of course. Uh, I'm really happy to hear that. <laughs> So uh, most of the thing we're doing with uh, MDB were, could be replaced by uh, syscontrol. The only one we can out was uh, modifying the ArcMax, for example. And in that case, we can do it through KGDB. So it's a big hackish, but we can do that. And we aim at being able to modify the ArcMax dynamically with uh, syscontrol. Uh, I don't know yet when we'll have time to work on that. But it's not that complicated. You just need to be sure that you can do the operation. But it's safer, uh, it will be safer than using KGDB and, or NDB and all that should have to work. Uh, and since FreeBSD is uh, following closely what happened on ZFS uh, on Illumos or on the Open ZFS community, uh, there were uh, all the improvements from ZFS that happened in, in particular, the one we were the most interested in uh, was the uh, threaded zip pool import which reduced the import from 20 minutes to uh, around, I think we are 2 minutes now, something like that, or a bit less when it's very, uh, well, we still need to have some more benchmark on it because we managed to improve it again. So just a pro tip, don't ever use stream on ZFS if you want, uh, if you want the pool import to be fast. <laughs> don't ever do that because uh, you will have a huge contention on the uh, ATA command when Trim is uh, trying to flush everything on the cache and on the log. So don't ever disable <coughs> Trim and you figure out that the, in one place zip pull import is very, very fast. We also figured out that zip pull import is faster on FreeBSD uh, without Trim than on Solaris. So we're very happy with that. 
Unfortunately, FreeBSD is not good everywhere. There is very bad issues. So on our filers, we wanted to keep all the disks for the filer itself. So we want the, the operating system to run in memory. And so we will netboot the operating system, we will keep it in memory, and we will leave all the disks for the, for the filer themselves to do the job. Uh, and FreeBSD sucks a lot when dealing with that. So try to boot MFS root. Uh, first, it will be very slow. Uh, so thanks to the most people, there is a patch now for the loader to be way faster than that. But even if you get faster, try to get an MFS root which is larger than 2 gigs and you'll figure out that crazy things are happening on the memory and you will get a non-usable system. Um, FreeBSD has also no multi-boot support, so we cannot use IPixie. Uh, the reason we wanted to use IPixie is uh, first we're also booting some Linux box the same way uh, through network. IPixie provides us uh, with a uh, with a loader that, is, that has some drivers for your network cards, so you could fetch at maximum speed. So if you have a 10 gig interface, you can fetch at 10 gig instead of having the slow interface you get otherwise. And we wanted to use that, and the support for IPXC is really, really bad. So if you want to use IPXC, you have to switch back to uh, Sandboot, meaning that you cannot anymore provide any information on how the system should uh, pre configure itself. Uh, via the option you could pass through uh, DHCP or through uh, uh, the TFTP server. But anyway, we went to uh, the road of doing that on FreeBSD. So the design is uh, we want everything discussed. Uh, we want everything unattended. So we boot the fire, we wait a bit, and then it's operating by itself. No one has to touch. Uh, no sysadmin has to uh, interfere in the in the process of booting or installing or even uh, bootstrapping the first file. You just put it there, put the information on the DHCP, start it up, ready to run. Uh, what this test provides us is a readability. If you want to upgrade the, the machine, just reboot. You don't need to go through an upgrade process, having to deal with good environment or something like this. Just provide the new image on the TFTP server, reboot, and then you're on the, next, the new one. Uh, it allows us to do some easy backtracking. So uh, we want to upgrade all the next center servers to uh, FreeBSD, not only provide the new filers on FreeBSD. So upgrading them, we want to be able to work to backtrack for if for whatever reason the first version of, of the filer we provide on FreeBSD have issues, we want to be able to reboot on the next centers. Given the next centers was installed on the disk, then we can just Boot on the network, get the free BSD, it's LFS, so we can import the one from NextCenter. As long as we don't run the pull upgrade, the LFS upgrade, then we will still be able to reboot on the NextCenter if an issue happens. When we're 100% sure that the new version is very good, is good enough, then we do the pull upgrade, uh, the LFS upgrade, wipe out the NextCenter, we use the disk for what it's supposed to work for, meaning the filers, and be done. Um, and we want it to be free from admin errors. Admin errors are the guy that goes to the box and oh, there was an issue, I just fixed something there, and we're done. Because we're this class, each time we reboot, everything like that would have been wiped out. So, given that, people that are handy to do that will have to go through modifying the puppet, so going through the review and making sure that at the reboot everything will be there so we can track exactly what happened instead of having those dirty, uh, hackish fixes done everywhere, which of course never happens. <laughs> so, as I said, um, booting over IPC is a mess. Booting FreeBSD uh, over a network is a mess. So we had to find a way to be able to quickly boot FreeBSD over a network. Uh, we didn't have time to um, implement the FreeBSD loader inside IPixie, and it, we don't think that the right direction to implement the FreeBSD loader in every single uh, loader of the world. So the right solution would be to turn the FreeBSD kernel into a multi-boot kernel. Uh, so for those who don't know what is a multi-boot kernel, it's a specification, it's a protocol 
that has been designed uh, by the Grub people back in the time, but uh, followed by uh, Elamos people, by Linux people, by uh, NetBSD people, so that a kernel will always look the same. So if your mother knows how to put the kernel, how to put the system, then you can put every of them. So that it prevents us from having to go everywhere. Of course, it has drawbacks, and it will change some of the way that currently FreeBSD works, so you can just decide tomorrow, let's switch to that, and screw all people that expect the current behavior to still happen. It needs to be discussed, think about, and, and see what we can do. So we ended up having something that goes through uh, TFTP. TFTP is very slow, so we wanted to get something minimal we could get through TFTP. Getting into a kernel, it has the driver for the network interface, so that next we can fetch the large blob that we will use as a RAM disk for the system. So for that, what happened, first we the server boot, DHCP request because it's a PXC request, it fetches the PXC boot, uh, the PXC boot fetch the configuration file it needs, the kernel, the modules, and the mini root. The mini root is uh, 3.5 megabytes, no more. And uh, this mini root is using um, is only containing uh, init, shell, and a custom shell script, and fetch, of course, to be able to fetch. And what we need to validate that the image we have is uh, the image we will fetch through HTTP is the image we expect. The homes, the mini root has, uh, mini root has uh, booted. We have a full FreeBSD kernel, so we have some drivers, so we can run our own RC. Uh, RC will create a RAM disk, so uh, MD, uh, the MD based one. So the reason we use uh, MD based one and the TMTFS is because we want to reroute on it. So reroute is a new mechanism we got on FreeBSD that will. Uh, it's a bit like pivot on Linux. It's a bit different as well. So what people do did does is it will um, it will tell the kernel to reboot the user on and only the user on and to reboot on a given uh, GM device. So we needed the GM device, and we get the GM device, we get the RAM, we use the RAM disk. So we create that RAM disk, uh, we fetch the file.txe, uh, so file.txe is uh, the base system plus a couple of components, uh, a couple of packages we need. Uh, it fetches a config.txe, which is a general purpose config. The reason we separate both is that we can update the config on a regular basis without having to rebuild the entire system. And it fetches a special puppet uh, file, so uh, apparently the end has been eaten by uh, HTML, but uh, so it's puppet tfqdn of the filer, which gets through the option passed by the uh, DHCP server. And this puppet is a configuration with a certificate and everything that is needed to be able to run puppets on the on the file. It extracts everything into the RAM disk and it will root on that RAM disk. So the boot process starts again, and you only have the user one that reboots, so it's very fast, and then you get on your proper file. Once you run it, you run the pool import, you import everything, it takes a few seconds because we are on the new Z pool import and because we disabled tree. Uh, we run puppet run. Puppet run will make sure that the, the fire is specialized for this particular data center, this particular place, well, have everything we expect, the latest version, put the SSH keys at the right place for the different usage, and make sure that it's not the, the Gandhi middleware is at the latest version and it's started and running and it's ready to serve. We, doing that, my last test was we went from 45 minutes to 2 minutes and a half, including the BIOS. Of course, we disable uh, on the uh, LSI card, we disable the fact that it checks if the disks are available because we are not going to put on them, so that also reduces the time uh, for booting. So, as I said, uh, Gandhi is an open source uh, friendly company, so we wanted to contribute back uh, things we needed. So, obviously, as I'm a FreeBSD committer, it was easier. Marcelo is also working, and Gandhi is also a FreeBSD committer, so it's obviously easier to uh, push things into a FreeBSD. Uh, but contribution are not only uh, pushing core and debugging. Uh, we, have trying, we are trying to go uh, further than that. 
So the first contribution we did is uh, we needed to deal with ZFS uh, with our Python middleware. So until now we got some crazy uh, on Excel. We reused the middleware we had on Excel, but until now we we had some crazy um, uh, Python dot call so process dot call calling a command uh, ZFS command having some hairy uh, regular expression to try to extract the right thing at the right place. Uh, you had to pray, uh, kill a chicken, sacrifice a chicken and whatever to make sure that you will absolutely get the right thing. But on the other hand, there were the Freenas people that were working on um, on uh, Python binding on top of LibLFS. And so we decided, yeah, why not use that stuff? So we started, we started to use this stuff, we discovered that there are different usage than ours, some body was not yet implemented, like apparently at the time they were not cloning using uh, that, so we implemented the clone, uh, they were not promoting any data sets, uh, any uh, snapshots, so we implemented the, the promotion. Uh, at this time we got finished, so we got a commit bit in the FreeNAS repository, and uh, we added more things like supporting properties, uh, they had properties, but not the custom one. And we wanted to not only uh, get those properties, but being able to set them. And we use a lot the, the, um, the uh, custom properties from ZFS. So we needed the, the binding to be able to set them. And we implemented volume support, because it was uh, at the time only supporting uh, the file systems uh, from the file system data set and not the volume. And we did some couple of bug fixing, and of course, they bug fixed our bugs. So everyone was happy. I think the freelance people are also happy with that. Less work for them, less work for us. Maintained by multiple person, it's better. Then we are dealing with um, with uh, LSI uh, with LSI cards, uh, SAS two, SAS three. Uh, we got couple of issues uh, with the official tools, like some were making the kernel, the, the kernel driver yelling, so I got a lot of pollution into my syslog just because I tried to query what, what is on my, uh, behind this card. And I heard that uh, Netflix people were working on uh, MPS and MPR util. So on FreeBSD we have the habit to get the utility per uh, each LSI card, and those two drivers didn't have yet the utility. So we had them, where are you, have you done this, and say, ah, oh, it's not finished, we have that there. Now please push that into a product on FreeBSD, we'll have a look. So we had a look, we finished the part that they haven't yet had time to finish, and which was mostly clean up, making sure that it interacts correctly to the build system, and then we merge that into FreeBSD, and we added recently um, the ability to uh, flash the, the BIOS and the firmware from those cards, so that we don't need to use the SAS2 flash and the SAS3 flash. So it's good for uh, SAS2. I just discovered a few days ago that it's broken for uh, SAS3. I don't know why it's broken now. It wasn't when we tested, but we will fix that and we will come in that. Uh, we contributing also means testing, play, playing the Guinea pig. The Guinea pig. So, Reroute was a mechanism we really, really needed because of the way we wanted to boot and we wanted to boot fast. And we discovered that uh, Elwok Trash was working on this feature. So before we was committing, it was waiting for people to test, we didn't have much feedbacks. So we took the patch, we tested it a lot, we gave feedback, this doesn't work, this doesn't work, this works. And in the end, he committed that, so now we are both happy he had this tester. Yeah, he has been able to commit that, and I can boot my father the way I want it to be boot. Um, Trust was also working on the smarter moon, mount root weight, so basically that mechanism uh, in the RC script to make sure that all the uh, well before starting uh, a lot of things and before mounting uh, the all the file system on the on the on on the operating system, uh, we are sure that all the potential provider of this image or whatever uh, are all available. But 
it takes time. It could be long if you have to probe through uh, all the USB or the uh, I don't know uh, iSCSI chain and things like that. But Trans was working on something that was looking at hey, I already have the device which is not in as the root file system. I don't need to wait for the other. I have it. Let's boot on it and then do the other uh, do the other wait uh, in background. So we wait for the device in background, but during that time we can still boot which improved the speed of the boot, so as we wanted to boot fast, we were very happy to test that. And it's now also uh, integrated into uh, 11, I think it has been merged into 10.3. Syntax? Sorry? Syntax? How do we do that? Oh, it's automatic, it's by default. Oh. You don't have to do anything, it's just, uh, basically it was just fixing uh, the way it was working. Um, so, <coughs> We have Gbot, so we have uh, Enclosure to deal with. Uh, and if you want to just look at the drive, because you know the drive is failing, it's broken, and then you're calling someone to go in the data center, change the drive, you probably want him to be able to look at it properly. So if you want to deal with that, you either check the official tool from LSI, and, uh, or uh, you use the, uh, um, there is a Linux SG3 util, which includes the SG SES, um, tool and this tool will be able to uh, do a lot of things on a, on, a, on a SCSI enclosure device but it's very 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 unfriendly if you try to map what disk so I know that DA4 is broken and this has a crazy uh, you have to turn it into the crazy chain view by the, the SES uh, protocol to be able to figure out that oh DA4 is this blah 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 long string something and so I can use uh, SGSS on it and so I really don't you know, like the interface of SGSS for all the stuff so I decided I just want to be able to look at the drive I don't want to have one tool per uh, controllers one for the SAS2 one for the SAS3 and I uh, Edward Truss as no uh, Alexander Martin uh, was putting some examples on how to use uh, the SES devices and so I just took at those examples and I created a tool which is SES Util uh, which has a very very easy to use front end because it was the, uh, the, the initial goal and um, with this SES Util if you need to locate the drive then you just need to put the name on the drive and the, the utility will do the mapping for you instead of leaving the administrator trying to figure out that the 3 is blah 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 and we also want that to be uh, useful, so often uh, people might have forgotten that they have some light on, on the filer, so you say to your guy that goes to the G-Bot changing the disk, hey, the one that is uh, blinking right now is the one you need to change, and there is 10 disks blinking because someone has played with it before. So instead of having to go through all your disks and you can have a lot, just add a look at all, off, switch everything off and switch it on. So since We've done that, all the people have come in and have uh, improved our tools, so uh, Alan Jude has added support for mapping what is behind your enclosure, so you get every single information. So now we uh, updated what it, what it did, and we added the fact that you can get information like temperature uh, inside your uh, Gbot and things like that, which can be very important because if the temperature goes too high in a part of the Gbot, it can lead to performance, uh, to uh, decrease of the performance, or things like this, so being able to figure out that quickly was very nice. Uh, well, I've been basically explaining why we haven't used the vendor tools, and we don't use uh, SGSS. Uh, so, the only thing we contributed back to FreeBSD was uh, the PXC boot support with TFTP uh, sucks a lot on FreeBSD. Uh, so basically, if by default it's built with NFS support, so by default, okay if you do some NFS, but you can rebuild it with TFTP support. If you rebuild with TFTP support, it, it expects to see your um, your boot environment, so your slash boot at the root of the TFTP server, which is really what we don't want because we may want to provide different version uh, at the same time. So we modify it to so consider TFTP as a file system and we use the same option which was used for the NFS so that you can provide the root pass on the TFTP server and it will prepend 
on every get the root pass on it so you can now have multiple slash boot in your TFTP server and choose which one you want to uh, via the DHCP option. Uh, I have time left, yeah, 10 minutes. Uh, so one of the things we do is we are running ahead on those fire. We plan to keep running ahead until uh, we are sure that all the patches we've committed are in the FreeBSD system. We'll probably go back to uh, 11, except if we do major other modifications. So as long as we have provide patches to provide, you want to remain on head. Head is pretty stable uh, most of the time. Uh, it's straightforward to uh, provide patches to, uh, to, to commit patches into FreeBSD if you already work on head and you don't have to backport the fixes you can see on head. Fixes come very self, very more, they first appear on the head, so we we'll benefit from going fixing first. Uh, it's, and because we know and we have very well identified workload, then we can test and make sure that the version of head we're pushing on production is stable enough for us. So to make sure of that, uh, we have created a test lab and on our test lab we have reproduced the entire workload of the fire. By the workload of the fire, I mean, so uh, we are simulating broken disks. So I don't know who ever wrote GNOP, but thank you. It can fake uh, broken disk errors on the read, on the write. And so you can see immediately ZFS yelling at you because, hey, my disk is broken and things like this. So we can test, we can simulate what would happen in that case. Uh, using IPFW, Dominet, we plan to uh, simulate all the bad network access. Uh, we also uh, simulate crashes, reboots, uh, reboots on the iLoad because one of the issues is you get all those clients on their VMs doing crazy stuff and then they're in crash and you reboot so when, they, when you reboot then your SQZ is there again your NFS is there again and they're trying to push everything into your fighter and trying to kill your server so we wanted to, to test that to validate that it works correctly and that we're not dying when we are uh, rebooting in that case uh, before that without those testing what we had to do was sometime we had a crash it reboots got overloaded, so we had to neuroroot some of the clients to say, eh, you will find the file later, let those first. So, and FreeBSD uh, is uh, behaving uh, remarkably well uh, in that situation, so we don't have to neuroroot actually, but because we tested it, we'll figure out if something is wrong. And we run the profile-based, uh, we made a profile-based uh, test lab because uh, we cannot run the entire, you can imagine that testing a full workload would take uh, days of testing, so sometimes we just want to taste this part, this part, the SQZ, the MFS, and things like that. I'm finishing and the question. What's that so uh, we're using Zopio. Zopio is a framework, a Python framework. To uh, it's done by uh, LinkedIn people, <laughs> by LinkedIn people, <laughs> and it's really done to uh, make distributed tested tests, and it has a very very nice interface. It was the main point we wanted to uh, grab numbers and draw nice, uh, make nice graphs out of it, nice, uh, we can really do things with uh, numbers, as making code ourselves to distribute things, it's easy, we're geeks, but I mean, making good graphs uh, and, and more important, uh, accurate graphs is way more complicated and Zopio does that very well. We have a bunch of future plans for the fighters. So we want to improve CCUTL, maybe uh, use uh, Libexo to have a parsable output so that we can get input directly uh, into our middleware. Uh, we also want to be able to update the microcode of the g -bot. And we also want to extend the, lo the locate so that we can locate actually uh, power supply, fans, and things like that. It's fairly easy. It's just a matter of time to find the right magic numbers that this is the, the fan for the uh, for the power supply or something like that. Uh, we have planned to uh, to improve the DFS as well. I don't know when we will be able to do that or if someone will uh, bite us at doing that. But we want to improve the speed of the pool of the pool import. So these slides were written before I discovered that Removing the trim was getting us a lot of performance, so now it's less critical than it used to be. Uh, 
uh, we want to make the Oracle Max tunable in a safe way via uh, syscontrol so that we don't have to reboot if we need to change the Oracle Max value. Uh, we have crazy idea about some new feature we could add about, we could add to it. We'll see if we can do something, and that will be a surprise for our next talk another day. Uh, we plan to support to improve uh, IPC, uh, either pushing it to turning the kernel into multiboot or ending up uh, having a specific previous specific order into uh, IPC. But I really don't like the first idea. Uh, we plan to improve CTL, so uh, on our usage, we, we use way more port that is defined by default in CTL, so we had to modify the, the, the value, and so we would like this value to be uh, tunable, so that we can modify on the fly, or at least at boot, and we don't have to patch uh, FreeBSD, the less we have patches on FreeBSD, the better we are. And we were trying, to, we are planning to add libcl support to CTL, but it was done. It has been done two weeks ago. Uh, and we plan to uh, st yet improve uh, the storage related tooling so that it's simpler and simpler. I'm, I'm new to the storage, so there is a lot of things I don't know, so I figured that a lot of tools that are easy for most of you are really, really not user friendly. It's just because you know exactly how storage works. I don't know, and I don't understand. Exactly like the sets, uh, the sets command, uh, things like that. I prefer having look at my list and look at this magical thing. And uh, there is, uh, to, I've been bitten on that too, we had a, a plan to improve the geo multipass uh, algorithm uh, because the run we have right now doesn't match really with how the DFS works and uh, Alan Jude has already made that, so if someone wants to review, it's on the review, we test of course, but if you want to make active-active uh, multipass on the filers, you will, to, you will have to go through the same way uh, LMOS people have been to, and they modify the MPX, MPXIO driver so that they get a new algorithm available just for the DFS. <laughs> Thanks. I don't know if you have any question. I don't know if I have time for question. Yes, three minutes. Yes. How many filers do you have? Uh, 100, around two, close to 200 if I remember correctly. How many disks per filer? Uh, depends on the generations. Uh, or is, we are around, around 30 disks per filer. Not, not including the cache, not including the log. Yes. How's the conversion going to Nexenta? What percentage? Uh, right now we have not yet converted the first one. We have the new we have the new generation, which is uh, well. The goal was first to uh, upgrade the Nexenta directly, so we have upgraded in the test lab. And but the problem is we got new generation of hardware. Nexenta doesn't work on this hardware, so right now the FreeBSD are uh, directly on the new hardware, so we're not in the upgrade pass. We are directly into the proper pass. Thank you very much.